this afternoon for a, uh, a rare uh, meeting on uh, Ecuador uh, that uh, doesn't get, I think, uh, enough attention here in Washington. Um, it was just 10 months ago in a very closely watched and, and controversial election that Lenin Moreno uh, won a narrow victory over Guillermo Lasso. Uh, since Moreno was the vice president of, uh, had been the vice president, Rafael Correa, and he was his handpicked successor, it wasn't unreasonable to think that uh, the new president of Ecuador would essentially build on Correa's uh, decade-long rule and pursue a very similar course. But upon taking office, uh, Moreno uh, found the country in pretty bad economic shape and with a widening public concern uh, about corruption. Uh, he not only distanced himself from Korea, but in fact appears to be developing uh, policies and pursuing actions in clear defiance and opposition to Korea. Uh, policies aside, Moreno's style uh, surely contrasts sharply with Korea's. He's conciliatory, consensual, and has reached out to sectors in civil society, society and the business community uh, that have had a rather hostile relationship with Korea. According to the polls, Ecuadorans uh, like what they see happening and uh, overwhelmingly support uh, Moreno, about in the 60s uh, in the current uh, poll. Um, they back Moreno's uh, prosecution and the jailing of his vice president, uh, also Correa's uh, former vice president, Jorge Glass, on uh, corruption charges related to the Odebrecht scandal. And just over a week ago, on February 4th, in a national referendum and consulta popular that had seven questions, Ecuadorians strongly backed the government, uh, in effect, checkmating Correa and locking him out of a widely expected return to power in 2021. Uh, it was a big blow for Correa, eliminating indefinite reelection, with about 65% of the vote backing the, uh, the question. Why is Moreno pursuing this strategy? Is he doing it the right way? How much has Moreno really been able to change? And what can we expect now, both politically and crucially, in terms of economic policy moving forward? Can a consensus on an economic agenda uh, be reached? And have we heard the last from Rafael Correa? And finally, what does this tell us, what happened in Ecuador, if anything, about wider regional uh, political trends? Well, there are many questions, and there's no one better to provide answers than Cesar Mantufer, a very good friend and a close collaborator with the Dialogue for many years, a member of our Latin American working group. Uh, he's an academic, an activist, an important political figure, professor at the Universidad Andina, uh, president of the Movimiento Consultación. He formerly served as a member of the National Assembly and was the primary accuser in the recent trial against Vice President Jorge Glass. Um, welcome, Cesar. I'm tempted to ask if the glass is half full or half empty, but I won't, I won't do that. Uh, broken. I'll resist that. The glass is broken. OK, OK. Um, I, I just let me just start the conversation uh, about how you see the situation, what Moreno has done. Uh, why has he distanced himself from uh, Korea as he's done? Uh, how much has he really changed since he came to office, uh, I guess, last May, May 1st? Um, and how much is this the beginning of something more profound in terms of uh, really transforming uh, the kinds of uh, policies, the kind of model that was uh, built under Korea? Um, is there something called uh, Moranismo that we're seeing now instead of Correismo. Leninismo. 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 So, welcome. Oh. Michael, thank you very much. I'm very, very happy being here. Thank you very much for coming. I'm really honored being in this new uh, building, this new, this new space for the dialogue. I was, last time I was in the other, in the other place. So, thank you very much, Michael, for, for this invitation. A um, few years ago, only a few years ago, two, one, one and a half, two years, 
Uh, Lenny Moreno said that Rafael Correa was um, a political giant and that he was the best Ecuadorian president of all times, like uh, one and a half year. Fortunately for Ecuadorians, uh, the president has not honored his word. And um, on the contrary, uh, at the moment, few days after he was uh, in office, he started uh, distancing from, from, from his mentor, from his political father to, in some ways, and he started, uh, I think, in a very personal uh, dispute uh, internal dispute within Alianza País. I think that we have to consider first that uh, this dispute between Correa and Moreno is a dispute uh, for holding power inside the ruling party. I think that this, this has to be said because um, for explaining what's happening in Ecuador right now and for seeing what would happen in the future. One has to consider that during the 10 years of Revolución Ciudadana, Alianza País built a single party system. So everything that happens in Ecuador, uh, everything that is going on right now and this dispute between Moreno and Correa has to be interpreted as a dispute within the ruling party. That's why uh, other important politicians, uh, Jaime Nebot or Guillermo Lasso, although they have, import they have importance and they are political reference in Ecuador, have nothing to do with what's going on and everything is a matter within Alianza País. Uh, that's uh, probably the first premise we have to consider if we want to, we want to understand what's going on in Ecuador and I don't see that uh, this party, which is uh, this, this political system, which is uh, based on a single, single ruling party, is going to change. I don't see that Ecuador would go for a multi-party uh, political system. I don't see that, although what happened in the, in the referendum, and I, we can, we can uh, develop that much more, is going to alter, is going to change, is going to uh, imply a significant transformation of this one single party structure that has been structured, has been built in Ecuador over the last decade. So I think that what's going on right now and what's going to be the future of Ecuador still depends on what would happen inside Alianza País. So in terms of any change in economic policy, the model that, that pursued under Korea, you don't anticipate any what I see is modification that, of that? What I see is that um, the referendum, for, example, for instance, uh, the, the, the consequence of the referendum would be that the most important uh, supervision posts, the public prosecutor, the general controller, that during the decade of Obreismo were very close associates of Correa. Uh, they will now, in a matter of one year, that uh, the new transitional Consejo de Participación would have to evaluate the, the current uh, uh, controller, public prosecutor. These new uh, office, uh, top office uh, uh, members will finally uh, respond to Moreno. So what I see really is that over the last, over in the, in the, next, in the next year, uh, the, the, what would happen is that Moreno will, will gain control of, of, of the whole state, the same that Correa do, did over the last decade. Uh, I, don't, I, I think that it has been important, uh, the, this, the changes that Moreno have, have, have pursued. Um, I think that, uh, in Ecuador, we live right now, we've passed through a new political climate, a democratic climate. Uh, I think that's really important. After a, a decade of, of authoritarianism, after a decade of, of polarization, 
However, uh, what I don't see is changing is the same scheme in which the president still has an enormous influence and control over the, all the other institutions. So I would say that uh, in Ecuador we have right now uh, a change in the personnel that is, running, is going to run those institutions, but I don't see like a change in the model. I would say uh, that Ecuador uh, is going through a transition, but a transition within the same hegemonic scheme, within the same hegemonic system. Not really a transition to democracy, not really a transition to a multi-party political system, not really a transition to a pluralistic society. A transition from Correismo to Leninismo, a transition from the person that ran the country and had an enormous control of the whole state to a new president that would have probably the same or more influence over the other institutions. So the, the system of, of concentration of power, the hyper-presidential uh, model in which the president uh, rules, really rules over the judiciary, rules, rules over the electoral institution, rules over the, the, uh, the, the, the whole state apparatus, I think might continue. I think that that's really what's going on in Ecuador right now. But you know, in, in policy, substantive terms, you just don't see a lot of difference. In other words, there isn't, the president has enormous power, but there isn't really a new agenda in terms of economic policy, social policies, uh, you know, the law of communications. We talked about that a little bit, you know, in terms of dealing with the press. Is there any concept that's, that sort of is at odds with what Korea had? Is it simply just sort of? Well, I think that. Um, Probably the, the most serious limitation for Moreno continuing the same economic agenda that uh, uh, Korea pursued over the last decade is probably the, a change in the economic environment and the crisis that the, the, the government right now confronts. Uh, I think that Ecuador now is, 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 is very transparent, it's very obvious that uh, the same economic policies could no longer sus be sustained if the dollarization is going to be preserved. Uh, in that sense, I think that the government might be forced over the, last, for over the next year to make serious changes in economic policy. Uh, but until now, uh, I think that uh, uh, there has not been any important, uh, important transformation, important, important change. Uh, uh, there, is, there are like serious economic problems right now, the public deficit, the raising public indebtment, the serious crisis of the social security system that I think is probably one of the most pressing problems uh, that I think will force the government to, to make important economic reforms. But until now, I think that the government has Focus and Moreno has focused on the political problem, the political dispute with Correa. And, and until now, I think that in this first year of, of Morenismo or, of, or more Leninismo, the, the, the concentration has been on the political realm. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ecuadorian public, I think, has weighted the referendum as the moment in which this political, the, this first phase of political concentration of the government will open the door for the economic reforms to other reforms. I think that uh, after February the 4th, the agenda of the, of the government will focus on these economic issues, basically. You're in touch with a lot of, I mean, you're connected to a lot of uh, different groups in Ecuador and the business community, you have good contacts, indigenous groups, environmental groups. Uh, how are the expectations that, you know, that they really for a change. Do you think that people have high expectations that they're going to be disappointed, or do you think they're realistic about what can be accomplished? Or? I think that after a decade of Correismo, uh, the new dialogical uh, way of ruling, of, of, of the, 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 this opening of, of Moreno's new style, 
has been uh, a relief for, for most Ecuadorians. I think that uh, that has been, has been important, really. Uh, uh, I think that the business community is, is, is waiting. Uh, there is like a, in, an important uh, mood in terms of, of uh, recognizing that uh, in terms of the way in which the government relates to the business sector, the private sector, uh, uh, at least there is like the the sense that uh, uh, the government the government is waiting for the business sector to to make proposals to to enter to engage in some way of dialogue. Uh, but until now, uh, despite you know, I think in some little changes, uh, there is not something that one can say we are living we are passing through a new moment. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that for Ecuadorians this change in style has not, have not been important. I, I want to stress on that. Uh, but uh, it is not enough in terms of what reforms the, the Ecuador, uh, that Ecuador right, right now needs. So uh, I think that uh, everyone, the business community, public opinion, are waiting right now to, to see what's going to happen after the, the public referendum. After the referendum, uh, I think that uh, Lenin Moreno uh, gave uh, a, a, a conference to the international press. And I think that what he said not really um, implied that it's going to be much change. He said that he is. Uh, open to talk to anybody, but that the government still is a government of Alianza País, and that he is not going to talk or to, to seek for support for the right or any other political uh, sector in, in, in the opposition or, or, or outside Alianza País. Uh, for me, that means that uh, the, the prospect that Moreno have, has in terms of what the future should be still is a prospect in which Alianza País and the disputes and, uh, inside Alianza País will continue being like the main uh, concern and preoccupation for the government in, and for Moreno's stability. Uh, in that sense, uh, I would think that uh, based on those, those declarations, uh, those presidential declarations, I, I, I'll see that change is not going to be much. So now that like leaders like Guillermo Lasso uh, supported the referendum, with you know, supported the government in the referendum, now after it's passed, move to the opposite, more of an opposition position. Is that right? Well, I think that um, the problem is that the main, the only great and main leader of the opposition to Moreno is Rafael Correa. So for opposition leaders, uh, it's difficult to side with Rafael Correa against Moreno. And, and I think that that's really a, a problem for, 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 for the whole political, uh, for, for, all, for the other political organizations and movements. Um, I think that um, the next local elections, which, going to, which are are programmed to be in February of 19, 2019 uh, would be like an opportunity for the, I would say, for the opposition of the opposition, because the opposition is the opposition to Correa, not the opposition to Moreno, have an opportunity of having some space in, 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 in the political arena. Um, for now, uh, until now, until in these first nine months of Moreno's administration, everything has been centered on this dispute, Moreno and Correa. And the other political movements, the other political leaders have been like uh, uh, covered up by, by this uh, main dispute. Mm -hmm. uh, but I insist that as a, this is a dispute within the ruling party. Uh, and. Uh, the political system remains being a single political party system. There was an article I read by uh, uh, Simon Pachano, who's a political analyst, who uh, 
was critical of the government for the way they framed the referendum, that it was, it was overly personalized, that, that wasn't a good thing, that you've really started this fight, and if you get into this kind of personal sort of Korea, Moreno, you know, Korea's a lot more politically uh, astute, he's more of a political animal than, than Moreno is, and that this could really, you know, consume the government and, uh, and not really and, and, and not really accomplish very much substantively and policy wise because they're just completely you know, sort of overtaken by this personal because Maria I assume you think Korea is not going to go into Belgium and just going to be quiet and retire that he's that he's a pretty resourceful guy and he's not going to sit back so do you agree with well, that? I think that the referendum was the referendum was planned planned and organized in order to reduce or to, to reduce Korea's power. Uh, if you see, for example, the question on uh, re-establishing re uh, terms limit, this was a, a, a question that uh, directly tries to block Rafael Correa for presenting himself as presidential candidate in the 2021 uh, presidential race. Uh, the question number three, which uh, restructures, so we're going to restructure the Consejo de Participación, uh, also tries directly to change uh, the, the post, the, the officials, which were very near to Correa as the controller, the public prosecutor especially, uh, and the electoral institution. Uh, so surely and clearly the referendum was organized uh, uh, against Korea and that's why Korea reacted and Korea returned from Belgium and he uh, campaigned for the no, no thesis. Um, that's clear. Uh, I think also that uh, the results of the referendum show, show that uh, Korea is still has still an enormous popular support, about 30% of the electorate, but that this support is not enough uh, for him to become really a, a threat to, to, to the political, new political establishment. If Correa supposedly uh, will be an, uh, once again presidential candidate, he, after the referendum, she, he is not able to be, but if he would be, uh, uh, again, a presidential candidate, he for surely be in the second round, but he would be unable to win it. So uh, he has passed in the last year from a majoritarian leader to a leader which is, who is important, but he is not a, a majoritarian leader anymore. Uh, I think Correa is politically alive, but um, I think he is weakened. Uh, I also think that we should not run out of the, of the possibility that in the next local elections, Correa would be a candidate, candidate for the for a major of Guayaquil or even Quito. Uh, I think he needs to be in the political in the political uh, competition. He needs to be in the political uh, uh, arena, and probably he would. Uh, to choose to, to be candidate and if and he's candidate for Guayaquil or for Quito he has an opportunity of winning so uh, uh, I don't think Correa is dead uh, politically dead contrary on that I, uh, contrary to that I think that Moreno uh, is not seen as, as a long lasting leader I think that Moreno uh, for several reasons including his health is seen like a uh, one-term president. So probably this wave of Morenismo, this wave of, of Leninismo, is not going to last uh, uh, much more. And we think that still everything goes around what happens inside Alianza País. Uh, even though Correa uh, quitted from Alianza País, if he would return to Alianza País, and Moreno is no longer there, I think that he can gain again the control of the party. So uh, that's why I think that uh, uh, Ecuadorian political future 
if this if we don't pass to a multi-party political system uh, gives Korea a lot of opportunity of reg regaining power within Alianza País and consequently regaining power in the country. Great. Um, before we open it up, I just have one final question. I know there are a lot of people here with uh, a lot of interest that want to ask you questions, but perhaps, uh, perhaps the topic that most comes up related to Ecuador by the press uh, these days is uh, Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian embassy in, in London, and uh, Moreno uh, has granted him citizenship. Uh, what is your interpretation of what uh, the government's posture is towards Assange, what is, and how does it differ, if at all, with, from Korea? Well, I don't know, but I think that um, recently uh, the government had made some very important or very huge mistakes in the Assange issue, giving him the, the Ecuadorian nationality, the Ecuadorian citizenship, uh, asking the British government uh, to uh, allow him to be a member of, of the Ecuadorian delegation, a request that was uh, denied, obviously, were huge mistakes. I think that uh, for some reason that I th most Ecuadorians don't understand, uh, Assange is more powerful than ever inside the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Uh, it's something that one can understand. Cannot. It's very difficult to, to understand what's going on. Um, I think that in, in terms of, of international policy, uh, Moreno has made important uh, declarations. He has like back off this support, his support to Maduro in Venezuela. He has had some interesting international uh, positions, uh, but nevertheless, I will insist on the idea that uh, Ecuadorian policy in general continues the same, the same path that Correa, that Correa's uh, government. Terrific. Thank you. Let's open it up. Um, just uh, tell, raise your hand. Tell us. We'll start with your former student who wants to. We'll start here, and then um, then we'll uh, go around. And just tell us who you are and uh, be brief. I'm John Polgahakimovich from the Naval Academy. Thank you. What a student, right? And former student of yours, former student, Andina. Right. Thank you, Cesar. Be careful. Yes, I'm. <laughs> he already graded me. It's all right. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I have a couple, a couple of questions um, about, about Moreno's governing coalition, what it's going to look like moving forward, because I think that will dictate a lot of policy as well as. Um, if he survives or not, right? Four years, we know what it looks like when, when governing coalitions in Ecuador break down and presidents then are, are removed. So uh, Santiago Asave recently wrote in, in Cuatro Pelagatos, I don't know if you saw this, basically there are two strategies, he says, right? On, on one hand, you know, Pais has 44 seats right now, basically, the, the Morenista faction of Pais. You need 69 to have a simple majority in the legislature and the National Assembly. So he says one strategy is, is you move to the to the center right, you you make friendly with with Lasso and and these people, and and that's where your policy moves, and you have a better chance of lasting four years. On the other hand, you could you could form a coalition with dissidents from Revolución Ciudadana or whatever the crazy movement is that that Correa is trying to form right now, and kind of other dissident leftists from Pachacutic and stuff, and that one might be more prone to break down since eventually by continuing policies as as you're suggesting you're going to run into all, all kinds of fiscal constraints, right? Um, so is there, like, is there a third way that you envision, or do you see one of those two uh, routes moving forward? Thank you. Thanks, John. Yes, why don't we get the question over here? Yeah. Back there. Thank you. Uh, Joaquin Madejo, Pan American Development Foundation. Thank you, Cesar. Um, my question is, uh, in the light of, of these developments and considering that in the, um, after the outcome of the consulta, there's a window of opportunity to implement reforms that hint to a democratic transition, what is realistic for civil society to expect in terms of reforming, for example, a communications law or creating a law that really uh, complies with international standards to regulate uh, civil society organizations and even 
solving even constitutional issues related to judicial independence? And what can the civil society do and expect through those efforts? Thank you. And then we have a final question in the back. Yes, please. Uh, I was actually the, the first uh, question. This is June Vidal from Congressional Research Service. I was just wanting to talk, what is happening inside of the party? I know there was a split. I thought it was 28 that went over to the Citizens Revolution. So um, yeah, like, what is the future of that? Because you said it's going to happen within the constraints of that party. OK. So, so why don't you start with those? Mm. Um, I will insist on what Moreno said to this in this uh, international press conference. He said that he is uh, open to talk to anybody, but he is not going to seek support or rule or govern with the right. So I think that uh, Moreno thinks that he still can uh, uh, pursue the next year or more of his administration, uh, maintaining this internal conflict within Alianza País. Uh, I don't see that Moreno is uh, ready to, let's say, give away the power that Alianza País accumulated over the last decade. I think that he thinks that his uh, role as president, uh, as president of the country and as president of Alianza País, is to solidify the, the ruling bloc, the bloc of Alianza País, as the only party that rules Ecuador. Uh, that's why I think that he ambitions his administration, his government, as an only and exclusively Alianza País government. I don't think that he thinks that a broader coalition would in some way uh, not only allows him for more stability, but also for a policy diversification in terms of addressing Ecuadorian problems. Uh, I think that he's still trapped in this Correo Morena, this Moreno dispute. And I think that he thinks that uh, uh, only maintaining the Al Alianza País unified is probably his basic role. Uh, that's why I think he chose as a new vice president a uh, hardliner socialist uh, in order to uh, 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 consolidate support in probably one of the factions or currents within Alianza País that might support Correa. So uh, uh, that was his opportunity of broadening the ruling coalition. And, 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 even in, and, and, and he chose probably uh, a person, Maria Alejandra Vicuña, which uh, expresses a hard line with the, of, of of social of, uh, of socialist uh, traditional socialist uh, vision or current within Alianza País, so I think that uh, uh, that's the the way in which Corre Corre Moreno thinks how he's going to rule the next years. In terms of, of what civil society might expect, I think that uh, although uh, Moreno uh, abolished the decreto the decreto 16, which was probably the best manifestation of, the, of Correa's attempt to control civil society. And that was, I think, very positive. There has not been any discussion from the government in terms of, of from the government in terms of, for example, reforming the communications law. Uh, nevertheless, the way in which uh, the communication law is being applied is much more, I would say, light or soft, but, uh, uh, I think that uh, at least I would say the left-oriented part of civil society in Ecuador would have some ear from Moreno, or ear from the government. Uh, and that, I think, at least is something positive. But uh, I don't think that uh, civil society is in a moment in which uh, really the government would like to have a pluralistic society in which uh, society is independent from the government. 
As you see, I, ha I am very pessimistic of what's going to happen in Ecuador. We could tell that. Yes. Yeah, yes. we picked that up. Wasn't it obvious? Uh, speaking of pessimistic, uh, Peter Hakem uh, has a question. <laughs> <laughs> As if things weren't pessimistic enough. No, uh, <laughs> I think, I think uh, well, at least I was hoping for a happier <laughs> profile of, of, of Ecuador. And I think most of us here were sort of looking for a little more positive uh, <laughs> what you're saying is that Moreno is not going to be the agent of change, political change. But the question is, he's not the only political actor, in, and Correa is not the only. Is there any other scenario? Is there an opposition forming? Is there an opposition that is pushing the government or pulling the government in any direction? Is there any scenario that you could see where, in fact, you know, it doesn't have to be Moreno, but there's somebody out there, some small party led by a committed intellectual that's uh, going to take the leadership. We're speaking at the Inter-American Dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we, you can think about that one to come up with a diplomatic response. Why don't we get a few questions over here? Yeah, these two. I'm sorry. Yes. Hi. Um I'm Elisa Medina from the Washington office on Latin America. And my question is actually about the recent news in Ecuador of uh, several um, members of the National Assembly actually asking for the president and vice president of the Commission on International Affairs to step down. And I wanted to ask you, like this wave of um, several congressmen or congresswomen who will ask for the presidents of the commissions who are part of the Correa, um, wing of Alianza País. Do you think that's actually against our law for, for how government should be shaped? Or how do you see these prospects forming in the future? Because mm -hmm. it's actually a bit concerning that they are now wanting to like take over with the Moreno wing over all the committees. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Carlos Jose Valderrama from Sidley Austin. Uh, Professor Montufar, one, one question. Uh, there's some news about the new trend in Ecuador on regards to uh, investment protection and promotion. Uh, there's some people saying that uh, the government is is looking to uh, uh, give uh, to come to bring back to life all of those uh, bilateral treaties and exit. So, uh, is that true? <laughs> That's Thank my question. You. Thank go you. those, and then we'll go. We'll do another round after this, but one, okay. you have three others. Yeah. Cesar. So, so. uh, regarding the last uh, question, I think, I, I think that that's true. I think that the government is uh, really interest, interested in opening uh, uh, economic uh, uh, doors in terms of receiving investment because the economic condition of the country is, is really in bad, bad shape. So I think that uh, one of the priorities of the government would be to reestablish those treaties, and I think that's that's uh, that's feasible. Um, in terms of of the second your your question, um, uh, what I have heard is that the dispute internally in país is 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 really really hard. So uh, probably uh, what would happen is that. Uh, uh, inside país, the Morenista wing is forcing the Correistas to step out of the party, uh, and that's that's that, that, that is the reason why uh, this is going on in in in, in the National Assembly. Uh, the Assembly right now is in chaos. I think uh, uh, the. President of the Assembly, uh, uh, Serrano, Jose Serrano, is in, at this moment in, he's not in control. Uh, but that has to do with the problem inside the, 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 the ruling party. And that brings me to Peter's question. Uh, yes, I think that um, uh, one can reflect on the fact that probably this is the only transition possible in Ecuador. Uh, because uh, after in Ecuador during the Correista decade, 
a single party political system was built is very different from, is very difficult from outside, and that happens with all politicians outside Alianza País, to influence in some way what's going on in the country and inside the, the, the ruling party. So probably uh, this kind of transition, transition from within the ruling coalition or the ruling party is the only transition possible. Uh, I was, uh, Michael was, was uh, uh, talking about this, and I was uh, remembering O'Donnell's transition theory, and these transitions go or are possible when they come from within the authoritarian uh, uh, coalition. And that is exactly what has happened with, with Alianza País and Moreno. For instance, if Guillermo Lasso would have won the 2017 election, probably he would not have been able to do anything because the whole political uh, arena will had conspired against any reform that he could he would have uh, attempted. So this, I think, is probably the only transition possible. And that's why I think that, although what I have said, uh, Moreno should, be, should receive an important credit. Uh, the problem is that this is not enough. And that uh, if uh, Moreno doesn't break with this closed political coalition that, that is Alianza País, and I think that uh, Ecuador is not going to be able to uh, pursue the policies that Ecuador needs in terms of uh, his especially the economic agenda for confronting the problems that I, that, that I mentioned. So uh, it's like a paradoxical situation. On the one hand, this is the only transition possible, but this kind of transition is not enough. And I don't know what's going to happen after that. Thank you. Uh, Judy, take some questions over here, then we'll go over there. Yeah, sticking to the investment theme. So, uh, Judy Brown. From Judy Brown, I'm from Rio Tinto. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the investment theme, there has been sort of a lot of back and forth, particularly on the mining and extractives, oil and gas mm -hmm. investment. Certainly, as part of the referendum, they seem yeah. to close yeah. uh, areas to mining that had been previously been opened, and then the mining minister resigned, and now the deputy has become the mining minister. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of the dynamics of those policies, because Ecuador, for example, is quite into the business of courting, at least they were under Cordoba, mm -hmm. of courting big mining companies to make investments. And it's sort of confusing as to what this might mean for the future. Thank you. Yes, sir. Same question. OK. Rio Tinto is in force. Yes, please, and then we'll go over there. Hi, I'm Richard Bone. I'm a student at the George Washington University. Um, you spoke about the government shift on policy towards Venezuela, which is a drastic shift from the Correa policy. And I'm curious if you could elaborate on if that is just a shift on one issue, and if so, what what led the government to shift its position, or if it signals a wider shift in overall Ecuadorian foreign policy. David, now we'll go over here. Thank you, uh, Cesar. My name is David Alzate from Georgetown University. Um, I was wondering, what is the way out for the Ecuadorian economy? So we have extremely high levels of investments, deficits. You know, the confidence aspect is kind of shaky because of all the things that you're mentioning. Um, will we open lines of credit with multinational, multilateral institutions? Will we like what 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 needs to happen? It's not very clear in my mind. <laughs> You've been very patient. It's yes. a question for Anna Lucia Mijos. <laughs> <laughs> Over here, Ben. Ben, at the left. Just one final question, and then we'll take another round. But you want to get this? thank you. Uh, I'm I'm Robert Thomason. I'm an anti-corruption reporter for MLEX, and my question uh, builds on your foundation in the Jorge Glass case. Could you comment on the direction of Ecuador's anti-corruption? Regime, uh, from from your, you would have a very unique point of view in answering that question. What, what, what's your assessment of its effectiveness now, and especially uh, the future? Yes, I think that um, um, for sure, um, anti-corruption uh, for Lenin Moreno is one of 
his most powerful weapons against Correism. Uh, so I think that uh, the change in the Consejo de Participación Ciudadana and question one that had to do with the so-called muerte civil announced that uh, uh, the anti-corruption agenda of the government would be one of its priorities. Uh, I think that a priority that it's led uh, and it's uh, directed toward uh, Correismo and the close associates of Correa and even Correa himself. Uh, I would say that one of the ways in which the government would, would foresee uh, a path towards eliminating Correa as a political adversary would be uh, indicting him and, and, and putting him in jail. So what happened with Jorge Glass and what might happen with other close uh, associates uh, from, of Correa, uh, I think would, would happen in the future. So I see, I think that the anti-corruption agenda of the Moreno government will be an important, an important thing during, uh, for the next year and for the next years. Um, the, way, the reason why uh, environmental concerns, concerns, uh, concerns related to mining were so important in the referendum, two questions had to, two out of seven questions had to do with, with, with this, is because what I said, is because uh, Moreno still, still is uh, governing the country in terms of Contain, uh, in, terms of, in terms of responding to the internal disputes and issues within Alianza País. And within Alianza País, there is a strong uh, environmental win and a strong pro-environment uh, agenda. Uh, those derechos de la naturaleza and the Constitution. And, and, and that's why I think that these two uh, questions were included in the referendum. I don't see, think that, that that's going to change. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, Moreno uh, has tried over, in, in, over this last year to be very close and to these groups, to this current within, uh, to this win of Alianza País. And I think that that would continue uh, in the next year. So. That's why two out of, of seven questions had to do with uh, environmental concerns and environmental issues. Um, the, the questions on, of, I really don't feel prepared to, to respond to <laughs> you on that. Um, I think, however, that uh, probably the limit that Correa, uh, that Moreno would have is probably the, the economy. If the economy exploits, I think that probably this political scheme also would change. Uh, I think also, as I just said, that he is forced to take some action in the economy. Uh, if dollarization is going to survive in Ecuador, and that would also have, would have a enormous political cost uh, on the government. The Venezuela question? On the you don't see this as a major. No, I policy. think I think that uh, the the reason why uh, Moreno changed his position uh, concerning Venezuela, I think, had to do with more personal reasons in terms of distancing him from uh, uh, Correa. Uh, that's why he was critic of Maduro in several has been critic from Maduro in several times. Uh, but in general, I don't think that Maria Fernanda Espinosa uh, has uh, made any major policy shift in comparison of what Correa, uh, Correa's uh, international policy. Great. We have time for another round. Uh, I see a question. Yes, back here, and we're here. Good afternoon. My name is Adrián Ortega, and I'm a consultant at the World Bank. I just wanted to, to ask you a quick question. Can you give us an update on the PetroChina uh, corruption case? I know you were on the other side, and you know it's been a week from the 
from Korea uh, testifying. Uh, do you see, uh, can you give us a possible outcome out of this case? Thank you. Yes, we have a question here. Yeah. Daniela Vallas, Georgetown University. Uh, my question uh, goes like, what do you think about Moreno's foreign policy towards the United States? Uh, you, I know you probably have heard like uh, the Ecuadorian government wants to negotiate a commercial agreement with the United States, like the one they did with the European Union. But at the same time, I don't know, like last year, uh, the Trump administration, they ended like eight with like the World Bank, well, reduced aid with the World Bank and the IADB. Wouldn't that open doors for like China's investment in like in Latin America and especially in Ecuador, like going through the same path we have been through the last 10 years? Let me also mention that uh, I want to welcome our friends from the uh, Ecuadorian embassy. We're here. Uh, the ambassador, Carion, uh, who I spoke to recently, unfortunately, is, is not in Washington, but uh, he is certainly somebody that we're in, we're in close touch with as, as well. Is there another uh, question over here? Yes, in the back, please. Thanks, uh, Francisco from PricewaterhouseCoopers. We um, work with a lot of private clients, and I was wondering if you can comment a little bit on the privatization of the Ecuadorian assets and the investment on what should we tell as a consultant in the US to our clients that want to invest in Ecuador. Thanks. Okay, thank you. You got another? Okay, two? Another one, okay. Okay, brief. Okay, go ahead. Okay, then we'll go back to this. Thank you very much. This is a, a, another subject that worries investors, which is the the um, the power of the controllers of the of the of, is is it going to be reduced? The the, the controller is, is very powerful in Ecuador. So, uh, is there any, any any measure against this? Yes. <clears throat> well, um, the constitutional uh, amendments which were approved by a referendum last uh, February the fourth only uh, deal with the change of the top officials on those institutions. They don't touch the attributions of those institutions, so that attributions will remain the same. Um, concerning to the question of PetroChina, um, well, um, for sure, uh, Correa was aware of what's going on with this uh, credit, uh, uh, credit line with uh, PetroChina. Uh, and I think that uh, what has been denounced uh, has uh, a lot of grounding in terms of if the public prosecutor decides it uh, could uh, link Correa to the investigation and could link Correa to a possible trial. So I think that uh, the reason why he was called to declare probably is a signal that in that case there is uh, a way and uh, a way a way for uh, for Korea being indicted and probably trialed on that issue. I don't think that that's the only uh, case in which Korea could be uh, linked. With the judicial case in which Correa could be linked. Uh, so I would foresee that, uh, and that has to do with the anti corruption agenda, uh, that in the next year, uh, uh, even though the current uh, public prosecutor was a person very close to Correa when he was president, he was, uh, he, he was part of his team. I think that uh, uh, the public prosecutor will, will in, at, so, at some point, will, will call Correa and will indict Correa, and probably he's going to, to confront a, a, a trial uh, for corruption. I, I, I think that that's going to happen in the next year. Probably is the most secure way of having Correa like out of the political, of the political process. Um, I don't remember the other questions. One on the United States. Um, yes, I think that the the uh, <clears throat> policy towards the U.S. Uh, in terms of what Moreno needs in this moment will be different, at least in different in terms of the rhetorical tone in, 
from what Correa uh, used to used to the way in which he used to approach to the to the U.S. Uh, so I think that at least there's going to be some talk from the government uh, for a commercial accord or something like that. So I think that that's going to happen in the next year. I don't know if that would uh, happen, but at least I think that that's going to be something that the government, the government is going to start talking. Uh, and uh, that has to do with the uh, investment treaties, and I think that that's going to be uh, related. Also, Jose Valencia, which is our U.S. ambassador, is also, is also here. So. Welcome, Ambassador. Welcome to Washington. To see you. Um, other question? Great, huh? I don't. Re I think there were other questions, but I think I think you covered everything. Do you have any any just to conclude? Uh, any final thoughts about you know sort of Venezuela, uh, Ecuador fitting into the regional regional trends? That's why I was thinking of that. Um, is there? You've written a lot about you know, Latin American politics, uh, transitions, populism. Is this? Can you just try to kind of fit? Ecuador's moment in a sort of a broader context, comparatively, historically, how do you see it? Um, probably what I think is that um, uh, this kind of uh, new regimes or populistic, uh, socialistic regimes, authoritarian regimes, com uh, 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 competitive or electoral authoritarian regimes, uh, this is the only way in which they can, can have some change. Uh, uh, if Guillermo Lasso would have won the, the election, uh, I think that our discussion here would be totally different. We, have, we, we might have, have had a government uh, uh, totally in a blockade and an institutional uh, crisis. Uh, Moreno at least has done an important, uh, has taken important steps towards at least provoking a transition from Correism, which is not a transition to democracy, which is not a transition to, towards a multi-party system. But, but uh, some liberties have been reestablished, a uh, democratic climate has been reestablished. Uh, Ecuadorian society, I think, is much uh, happier and tranquil that it was with Correa is less polarized. The polarization is within the ruling party. And I think that it's, that's positive in, 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 in any way. And I think that probably we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But uh, at least uh, Moreno has not honored his word on Correa. And I think that in this case, uh, in, in, this, in, in this situation, that the president has not honored his word is something positive. <laughs> yes, sir, uh, I want to thank you. This has been absolutely terrific and for coming here and sharing your insights. And we hope the, the glass becomes half full and not uh, half broken. Empty. Broken, <laughs> definitely not broken. Um, so thanks for your very, very oh, thank uh, you. terrific, insightful analysis. Appreciate it. <laughs>